For nearly 2,000 years, the Bible has remained the most controversial and contested book of all time. While we in our modern world take for granted the abundance of biblical translation, there was a time when men who handled or even read this sacred book had to consider whether it would cost them their very life. Since the crucifixion of Christ, for whom the gospel record was set forth, it might be said that the Bible has become the most bloodstained book in all of history. Men have fought for it, been burned at the stake for it. Believers have been imprisoned, beaten, killed, and even buried alive just for reading it. Our Father who art in heaven. While others have had their bones disinterred and for their faith in the word of God, been accursed to the uttermost. We judge him damned with the devil and his angels and all the reprobates to eternal fire. So be it. Bible-believing no. Christians have suffered all this and more for daring to communicate the powerful words of the Holy Scripture to a lost and dying world. Through the centuries, there have always been those who desired to share the love of the gospel message, and with them, others who were determined to destroy it. Yet for those who believe, the light of God's Word shines through even the darkest of times. Two thousand years ago, the life and death of a Jewish carpenter named Jesus of Nazareth forever changed the world. He was condemned for heresy by the Jewish people for claiming to be the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. He was crucified, died, and was buried. In fear, his followers initially abandoned him, but in time they were soon strengthened and emerged testifying of an empty tomb and telling all the world that God had raised Jesus from the dead. For David speaketh concerning him, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Upon hearing this, the Jewish people were pricked to the heart. When they asked, what shall we do? They were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. With the passage of time and the saving of many souls, the same gospel preached at first to the Jews would also be preached unto the Gentiles at the house of a devout man, Cornelius the Centurion. 
Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the, the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. From the house of Cornelius, the good news of Jesus Christ spread among both Jews and Gentiles alike. In time, the Apostle Paul would appear, establishing many churches. And as the gospel spread, it would be said that those who preached it had turned the world upside down. By the middle of the first century, the testimony of Jesus Christ began to be recorded in the four Gospels. Along with these were letters written by the Apostles, which would collectively establish the record of the New Testament. The clearest connection between the Old Testament and New is found in prophecy. The scripture says that prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The scriptures foretold of the first coming of Christ into the world and look forward to his second coming when he will judge the quick and the dead. But before that time, Jesus had warned that the church would endure great trials and afflictions for the sake of the gospel. The apostle Paul gave a similar warning when he bade farewell to the Ephesian elders. Paul and others warned about what would take place. Paul, for example, said, after my departure, there will come wolves, grievous wolves, who will lead the sheep away. Paul was so adamant about this imminent threat that he said, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He not only warned of grievous wolves, but also of the many which corrupt the word of God. While the apostle Peter warned that false teachers would bring in what he called damnable heresies, and that many would follow their pernicious ways, and because of them, the way of truth would be evil spoken of. Well, Satan is very clever in his ways of deception, and he will form a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit Christ, and a counterfeit gospel. Jesus had also foretold that his disciples would be persecuted and killed for their faith. He said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The apostle Paul had also been inspired to write, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In fulfillment of these warnings, the church was persecuted in the early centuries. Christians were hated and hunted by a succession of Roman emperors,
beginning with Nero in the first century and ending with Diocletian at the start of the fourth century. But by 313 AD, the face of what was called Christianity would undergo a dramatic transformation. When the Roman Emperor, Constantine the Great, won his famous battle at Milvan Bridge, a victory that would ultimately make him the sole emperor of Rome. Before the battle, Constantine claimed he had seen a vision of a cross emblazoned on the sun and heard a voice tell him, in this sign, conquer. Adopting the symbol, he went forth and conquered his enemies. A short time later, Constantine would sign the Edict of Milan, granting tolerance and protection to Christians. With the emperor's reported conversion, Christianity would eventually become the state religion. There was no Church of Rome when the Book of Romans was written, but ultimately when Constantine comes to power, uh, I don't think it was a good thing for the church. I think it was a corrupt thing. He began to put his cronies in power, but ultimately the church begins to develop its doctrine and appoint popes and, and uh, separate them over the laity. After Constantine was converted and he issued the edict uh, that the Christians were to be protected at least until uh, 331 A.D., when he issued another edict, that those who had not come under the authority of Rome were to be arrested and persecuted and their th churches and uh, records and all those things burned. But if Constantine were a true believer, how could he turn and persecute other Christians? Some researchers believe it was because his faith was divided. Researcher Dave Hunt writes that while heading the Christian church, Constantine continued to head the pagan priesthood, to officiate at pagan celebrations, and to endow pagan temples, even after he began to build Christian churches. As head of the pagan priesthood, he was the Pontifex Maximus, and needed a similar title as head of the Christian church. The Christians honored him as Bishop of Bishops, while Constantine called himself Vicarius Christi, Vicar of Christ for the cause of unifying the empire the pagan practices of rome were eventually combined with what was called the universal or catholic church but many christians saw in this new system an apostate union between the church and the powers of the world through constantine would begin the persecution of those who opposed the new universal faith as a result of his edict against heretics, it would be said that more Christians were persecuted after his conversion than before it. When the Roman Empire would eventually suffer its decline, the bishops of Rome would rise up and take to themselves the titles of Constantine, Pontifex Maximus, Bishop of Bishops, and Vicarius Christi, the vicar or substitute of Christ. As 17th century historian Thomas Hobbes wrote, if a man consider the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Because of his influence, some researchers mark the so-called conversion of Constantine the Great and his persecution of Christians as the real beginning of the Dark Ages. Jesus had warned his disciples, saying, Yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God a service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them.
While some may attribute the beginning of the Dark Age to Constantine, the record of history shows that the name of this era was given because the Bible was forbidden. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But in the 13th century, Rome made a concerted effort to put out that light and to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. The conflict began with a Catholic priest named Dominic Gutzman. It could be said that Dominic, along with Pope Innocent III, were the two original founders of Rome's most dreadful engine of terror and destruction, the Inquisition. The Inquisition itself began not because of witches or as a crusade against Muslims, but rather because of Bible-believing Christians. These particular believers were known as the Albigenses, so named because of the city of Albi in France. The Albigenses often debated with the Catholic priests, most notably with Dominic Guzman, today known as Saint Dominic in the Catholic Church. Though Dominic accused the Albigenses of believing heretical doctrines, his famous testimony against them reveals important details about their true faith. He said, It is not by the display of power and pomp, or by gorgeous apparel, that the heretics win proselytes. It is by zealous preaching, by apostolic humility, by austerity, by seeming, it is true, but by seeming holiness. Dominic argued that the holiness of the Albigenses was counterfeit and should be overcome by the allegedly true holiness of Catholicism. Initially, Dominic tried to oppose the Albigenses through preaching, but his efforts met with little success. The Albigenses were known for their extensive knowledge of the scriptures, and they refused what they saw as Dominic's apostate teachings from Rome. In the year 1206, the Albigenses made a confession that the Church of Rome was not the spouse of Christ, but the Church of Confusion, drunk with the blood of the martyrs, that the Church of Rome was neither good nor holy, nor established by Jesus Christ. It was at the Colloquy of Montreal in 1207 AD where the final theological debate took place between the Catholic priesthood represented by Dominic Gutzman and the Albigenses. Historians relate what was clearly seen as a defeat for Dominic, who was said to be no match for the Albigensian leader, Benoit de Terme. Researcher James MacDonald writes that Gutzman was humiliated by his failure. Speaking on behalf of Christ, Gutzman promised slavery and death to his opponents. To carry out his threat, Dominic would eventually form the Order of the Dominicans, which became the chief instrument of Rome's Holy Inquisition. Two years later, partly inspired by Dominic's fury, Pope Innocent III ordered the famous crusade against the Albigenses. The bloody effort was led by a close friend of Dominic's, the nefarious Simon de Montfort. Remembered by Catholics as a brave crusader, yet by Protestants as a brutal mass murderer, who was determined to wipe out not only the Albigenses, but all traces of their teaching. We read that the crusade of Simon de Montfort so utterly destroyed them that Simon stamped out not only a people, but a literature. By 1233 AD, Pope Gregory IX would establish the Inquisition as official church doctrine, and thus began some 600 years of bloodshed against Bible believers. As a direct result of the Albigensian Crusade, the popes began to outlaw the translation, possession, or reading of the Bible. Historian David Cloud explains that the light brought by the scripture made Rome's heresies plain. The persecutions which Rome poured out upon these peace-loving people 
were intended to destroy them as well as their scriptures. Beginning with the Albigenses, Rome's Inquisition continued its bloodthirsty cause for centuries. Its estimated death toll was recorded by historian John Dowling in 1845, who wrote, It is estimated by careful and credible historians that more than 50 millions of the human family have been slaughtered for the crime of heresy by popish persecutors. In modern times, it is traditionally thought that Roman Catholicism was the only form of Christianity until the Protestant Reformation. But history shows that Bible believers have always existed outside the Roman Church and were hated by Rome because of it. A history of these groups can be found in the book The Pilgrim Church by E. H. Broadbent. Broadbent shows that what these groups had in common was that they did not submit to the Roman papacy and they sought to follow God's word as their final authority. The Albigenses were one of these ancient groups and with them were the Waldenses. The Waldenses as a Bible believing people actually go back um, although this is disputed by some Bible critics they nevertheless go back to the second century and it appears that they had what was in effect uh, an old Latin Bible called the Italic version as far back as the second century and they were known as the Vaudois which means the people of the valleys. Rome persecuted the Waldenses again and again through the centuries for um, over a thousand years and tried to wipe them out but because by uh, the grace of God they were located in uh, an, an area which was easily defended the um, the mountains of northern Italy they were able at least to cling on to survival for um, uh, for centuries the Waldenses commitment to the scriptures was legendary their early Bibles were in Latin but in the 12th century their most famous leader Peter Waldo would translate the Bible into what was called the Romant language. Romant was a combination of Middle English and Old French. Yet Waldo's translation was rejected by the Church of Rome. Pope Alexander III expelled him and his followers, while Pope Lucius III pronounced a papal curse on them. They were persecuted their records were burned, destroyed, their names uh, slandered. Uh, our true church history, though, must ever seek to find this silver stream of believers that were never a part of Rome. They were in the valleys of the Piedmont between northern Italy and southern France. Uh, in the south of France, the, they went by different names, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Cathars, the Donatists. Yet in spite of Rome's efforts to destroy them, the ancient faith of the Pilgrim Church would prevail, and their example would influence the great men of faith that would follow. When the Reformation occurred in the 16th century, Rome would accuse Martin Luther, saying he only renewed the heresies of the Waldenses and Albigenses, which had long ago been condemned. But before the time of Luther, the faith of the Pilgrim Church would shine forth in the man who would be known as the morning star of the Protestant Reformation. The first complete Bible in the English language is attributed to John Wycliffe, who would translate the scriptures from Latin into what is called Middle English by about 1384. Uh, John Wycliffe is, is really called the morning star of the Reformation because Wycliffe believed things that the reformers 
uh, picked up and believed, uh, oh, more than a hundred years later, like uh, William Tyndall and, and Martin Luther and those reformers at that time. Wycliffe trained his followers to go out and preach to the people. They were known as Lollards and were so effective, it was said that if a man met two men on the street in England, one of them would be a Lollard. But because England was still a Catholic country, Wycliffe's followers suffered greatly, and many of them were put to death. During the um, 14th century, uh, before the onset of, of the English Protestant Reformation, Lollards, when they were captured, they were burned at the stake, and if they had any copies of Wycliffe's uh, translation, uh, then those uh, translations were, were tied around their necks, and they, those translations were burned along with their owners. Like the Pilgrim Church that had come before him, Wycliffe taught that the authority of the scriptures was greater than the authority of any man. He said that we ought to believe in the authority of no man unless he say the word of God, that if any man in earth, either angel of heaven, teacheth us contrary of holy writ, we should flee from him as from the foul fiend of hell and hold us steadfastly to the truth and freedom of the Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ. In addition to translating the scriptures, Wycliffe became known for rejecting the most deadly doctrine of the Dark Ages, transubstantiation. J.C. Ryle makes it clear in his writings why the reformers were under attack, because they went against what the Roman Catholic Church was for. For example, here's what he wrote. The point I refer to is the special reason why our reformers were burned. The principal reason why they were burned was because they refused one of the peculiar doctrines of the Romish Church. On that doctrine, in almost every case, hinged their life or death. If they admitted it, they might live. If they refused it, they must die. The doctrine in question was the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the consecrated elements of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. And just about everybody who was tried was tried for their rejection of transubstantiation. And so what we have here is Rome coming down hard and saying, you know, you have to bow to the host because that is Jesus Christ. And that's why you don't let the host drop on the ground because that is Jesus Christ. And you have the whole development of the Mass, which is a re-crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, because literally they teach that the body and the blood of Christ is literally, physically, actually there in the elements. As stated before, Wycliffe boldly rejected this doctrine. In his lifetime, the Catholic authorities tried to condemn him for heresy, but failed repeatedly. Nevertheless, Decades after his death, Rome would officially accurse him to the uttermost. Rome hated Wycliffe so much for bringing forth the Bible in English. It was the first um, a complete Bible in English. And Rome hated him so much for that that they actually exhumed his corpse and um, smashed it to pieces and actually burnt the bone fragments. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel, had called Wycliffe a child of the old devil, who had crowned his wickedness by translating the scriptures into the mother tongue. In 1428, the Church of Rome ordered Wycliffe's bones dug up and burned. One can only imagine the intense hatred Rome must have had to dig up Wycliffe's bones 44 years after his death. While Wycliffe had never been excommunicated in his lifetime, the Council of Constance had officially anathematized or accursed him after his death. In the Middle Ages, when a person was anathematized, a ritual was held known as the bell, book, and candle ceremony, the words to which are well documented. 
Wycliffe's official cursing may have sounded something like this. We separate the same Wycliffe, together with his accomplices and the betters, from the precious body and blood of the Lord and from the society of all Christians. We exclude him from our Holy Mother, the Church, in heaven and on earth. We declare him excommunicate and anathema. We judge him damned with the devil and his angels in all the reprobate to eternal fire. So be it. They dug up his bones out of the Lutterworth churchyard, they burned him to ashes and dumped him into the River Swift. Uh, now the historian says that the River Swift uh, ran into the uh, Severn and the Severn into the Narrow Seas, thus illustrating how Wycliffe's doctrine spread throughout the world. Indeed, the teachings of John Wycliffe and the Bible he translated would continue to influence Christianity right up to the present day and would dramatically impact the greatest event of the Middle Ages. As the Council of Constance had condemned John Wycliffe, it also condemned one of his most notable followers, a passionate reformer in Bohemia named Jan Hus, whose disciples were called Hussites. Inspired by Wycliffe, Hus opposed the doctrine of papal infallibility and asserted the authority of the Bible over the opinions of church leaders. As a result, he was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake in 1415. But before he died, he claimed that God had given him a promise. The name Hus means goose in the Czech language. And so the Lord had told him, they will silence the goose, but in 100 years, I will raise a swan from your ashes that no one will be able to silence. A century later, inspired in part by the sermons of Hus, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, an event that would launch the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. While it is often thought that the Reformation was somehow an anti-Catholic movement, the reality is that most of the reformers began as Catholic priests. All these guys originally were Roman Catholic priests. Uh, uh, Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest, but he came to know Christ as his Savior, and that changed his theology. Uh, and then the same way with William Tyndall. Uh, he was defrocked there in Valvord Castle. He was a Roman Catholic priest. The same was true of Jan Hus and others such as John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, and most famously, Martin Luther. It might be said that Luther had broken the dam of a great flood that had been gathering for centuries because of the controversies with the Albigenses and the Waldenses, because of John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague, a friend of Hus who, with many others, were condemned by Rome and burned at the stake for reading and believing the Holy Scriptures. There can be no question that the Bible itself was the weapon of choice used by the reformers who took up the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Yet there were certain conditions that came about in Luther's time that made a reformation possible not just in Germany but throughout all Europe. One of them was the invention of movable type by a man named Johann Gutenberg in 1440. Johann Gutenberg, who has invented not the printing press, but the movable type that you could take apart, put back together. Gutenberg started out as a goldsmith. There had been printing on wood blocks uh, for quite some time, but he 
makes it easy because you can make type and then reformat that type and so they start producing uh, numerous books of the Reformation, numerous Bibles of the Reformation. Prior to Gutenberg's invention, producing just one Bible took the average scribe some 10 months to copy. But in 1455, Johann Gutenberg published the now famous Gutenberg Bible, along with 200 copies in a single year. For centuries, Rome had been burning Bibles, along with the books written by men like Wycliffe and others. But now, these books could be reproduced at unprecedented levels. And that's why Luther could have such an influence. That's why Tyndale could have such an influence. That's why just books were starting to be printed that uh, a scribe didn't have to sit down in 10 months to, to do a Wycliffe Bible. You could do it in a matter of weeks now, a bunch of them, and, and get them out. So boy, that's what really uh, fueled the Reformation. Gutenberg's first Bible was based on the Latin Vulgate, originally translated by Jerome in the fourth century. Vulgate simply means vulgar, the common, common language. John Wycliffe's translation had also been based on Latin manuscripts, although it has been disputed what manuscripts they were. Yet Wycliffe and others acknowledged that the original writings of the Bible were mostly in Hebrew and Greek. The Jewish scribes had carefully preserved the writings of the Old Testament in the Hebrew language with selective passages in Aramaic. Meanwhile, the writings of the New Testament were recorded in Koine Greek. Which brings us to the second great event that brought forth the Reformation. The fall of Constantinople in 1453. The city of Constantinople was so named because it had been built by Constantine the Great in the fourth century and was originally intended to replace Rome as the capital of the empire. But after Constantine's death, the Roman Empire was divided east and west. While the West was primarily dominated with Latin as their earliest form of scripture, in the East, the people continued to read, write, and speak in Greek. In time, they would be known as the Byzantine Empire. Then in 1453, the Ottoman Turks, led by the Islamic Sultan, Mehmed II, conquered Constantinople in a victory that stunned the Western world. As a result, many of the Byzantine scholars fled into the West, bringing with them thousands of ancient Greek manuscripts, including many copies of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, you had them fleeing and taking their manuscripts with them. So uh, you, you have uh, uh, Mohammedism coming in, the Ottoman Turks coming in, and they're, they're taking over, so they're fleeing to Western Europe. In the years that would follow, many of these Byzantine scholars would begin teaching the Greek language in the universities of Europe. One of them was a man named George Hermonymus, or Hermonymus of Sparta. It said that he was the first person to teach Greek at the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Among his famous students was the great intellectual Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. The Reformation gathered momentum and indeed was sustained by the work of uh, the great scholar Erasmus who produced the uh, first Greek New Testament as a single edition. For Erasmus and many scholars of the time, the introduction of the Greek New Testament into the Western world opened a whole new understanding of the Bible. And Erasmus uh, works about the different manuscripts in different languages and was one of the novelties of this book because as we can open this book we can immediately uh, see that uh, we have on the same page 
two different texts. One is the version, version of the, the Greek text, and at the right, the column with the Latin text. And this form of this text was very, very radical at the time of Erasmus, because uh, at the time of Erasmus, the man has the, uh, usually published this text only with the Latin text. Erasmus, Erasmus was the first in 1516 to publish uh, the two texts on the same page. It was revolutionary for this time because the men of this time came to compare the original and the translation of Erasmus. And that modified the system of the religious thinking of this time. El precio de Bitcoin is muy económico. Uh, at the moment, the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has uh, very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's uh, rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important uh, to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego, imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want, in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y this gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. 
Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cla clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explicas, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later explain. Después lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. It's uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde, Puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's, this is the game part, if uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person, but if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out, and it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada, y si por ejemplo, okay, first translate. Print and not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente, 
Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta, das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some bitcoin and you and this person doesn't have, have any so you have already this public address where they can send you bitcoin ¿Qué es bitcoin? Bitcoin es la primera moneda digital descentralizada los bitcoins son monedas digitales que puedes enviar a través de internet. Comparado con otras alternativas, bitcoin tiene numerosas ventajas. Los bitcoins son transferidos directamente de persona a persona a través de la red sin pasar por un banco u otro intermediario. Esto significa que las comisiones son mucho menores, puedes usarlo en cualquier país, tu cuenta no puede ser congelada y no hay prerequisitos o límites arbitrarios. Miremos cómo funciona. Los bitcoins son generados en todo internet por cualquiera con un programa gratuito llamado Minero de Bitcoin. Crear bitcoins requiere una cierta cantidad de trabajo para cada bloque de monedas. Esta cantidad se ajusta automáticamente por la red, para que los bitcoins siempre sean creados a un ratio predecible y limitado. Tus bitcoins se guardan en tu billetera digital, que te resultará familiar si usas banca digital. Cuando transfieres bitcoins, una firma electrónica es añadida. Pasados unos minutos, la transacción es verificada por el minero y es almacenada permanente y anónimamente por la red. El software de Bitcoin es completamente abierto y cualquiera puede revisar el código. Bitcoin está cambiando las finanzas de la misma manera que la web ha cambiado el periodismo. Cuando cualquiera tiene acceso al mercado global, florecen grandes ideas. Miremos algunos ejemplos de cómo los Bitcoins están usándose hoy en día. Puedes comprar videojuegos, regalos, libros, servidores y calcetines de alpaca. Existen varias casas de cambio donde puedes intercambiar tus bitcoins por dólares, euros y más. Los bitcoins son una gran forma para que pequeños negocios y autónomos reciban publicidad. No cuesta nada empezar a aceptarlos, no hay cargos o comisiones y recibirás negocio adicional de la economía bitcoin. Para tus primeros bitcoins y más información visita weusecoins.com Bueno, ahora voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los dedos de Simpsons. Now I'll show you some pictures of the fingers of Simpsons. The four fingers, los cuatro dedos y cinco dedos de Dios. The four fingers and five fingers of God of Simpsons. Thirteenth of March.